right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2017 webinar series on the topic of equipping development actors to practice impact design. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. I will be one of your moderators for today's webinar. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join us the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Webinars. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinars. The emerging fields of impact design and development engineering are credited with delivering novel solutions to the world's most pressing, complex challenges. The products and services that they deliver are realized through transdisciplinary collaboration, enabling understanding of user behavior, cultural norms, processes, and political context. At E4C, we've observed and responded to the growing demand for training that prepares the next generation of practitioners to be better problem solvers. Likewise, universities, industry, and nonprofit organizations are also addressing this need by developing interdisciplinary programs and tools. Today, we've invited three impact design practitioners, Christian Benimana, the founding director of the African Design Center, Zoe Bispalco, the impact and design lead for the Autodesk Foundation, and Sophie Martin, the innovation director at the Blum Center for Developing Economies at the University of California, Berkeley, to share the range of models serving development actors to better equip and prepare them to practice impact design. I'd like to welcome our speakers and thank you for joining us today. Um, our moderator today will be David DeWayne, who is the Editor-in-Chief of the Impact Design Hub. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C Webinar Series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And also, I would like to note that today's um, E4C professional development offerings and information on upcoming webinar installments in the series, as well as archived videos on past presentations, can be found on our webpage, and the URLs are listed here, along with our YouTube channel. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to current news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our platform, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join E4C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. Next webinar will be next week on February 28th, where we'll do a technical deep dive on the topic of the role of robotics in global development with Raj Madhavan, who is the founder and CEO of the Humanitarian Robotics Technology. Um, additionally, look to our webinar in uh, March. I, I think the date here is uh, misleading because we're going back in time, uh, but it'll actually be in March, and the topic will be professional water well drilling in Africa, and some information will be provided by Dr. Kirsten Danner of the Rural Water Supply Network, and along with Jose Jeske from UNICEF. Um, that will be at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard for both of those webinars, and we encourage you to visit our professional development page uh, for more information. If you're already an E4C member, you will receive an invitation to these webinars directly, so another reason to sign up. So a few housekeeping items before we get rolling. Um, let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon in the top right corner of the screen. And I'll go ahead and get us rolling here. 
I mean, uh, joining everyone here from New York. I see uh, that folks are replying also in the Q&A window. I see we have folks in the Washington, from Washington, D.C. and Minneapolis. I, I'd like to encourage everyone to please uh, enter your feedback into the chat window, um, as that's going to help us to uh, keep everything straight. We have folks from Canada, from Toronto, my original hometown, Berkeley, Indiana, San Francisco. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have you here. Um, any technical questions or administrative problems should go into this chat window. And feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks that you might want to share with the other attendees. Uh, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, uh, which is again located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenters and we can keep track of them that way. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Lots of folks from D.C., welcome everyone. Uh, very excited to have you. Um, you uh, following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of the FRC professional development page. And again, you'll see uh, the link here on the slide. All right, with well, that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's moderator, uh, David Duane, who is the editor in chief for the Impact Design Hub. David is a journalist, architect, entrepreneur, and educator. His background is in, the, in ecologically and socially equitable design, having trained under Pliny Fisk III at the Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems in Austin, Texas. David's recent topics include anticipatory design, world population, and human values, spaces of hyper-creativity and leadership and creativity. David is a Halcyon Fellow and has been honored as an emerging leader by the Design Futures Council and certified as an evil agent by the World Bank Institute. He holds a Master's of Architecture from Rice University and we're very excited that he is joining us as today's moderator. And I'll turn it over to you, David. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so, hello everybody. Uh, this is my first E for Change uh, webinar, so I'm very excited to be with everybody. Um, just a little bit about Impact Line Hub. Um, Essentially, we are a uh, journalistic website that functions right at the intersection of design, um, social impact, and advocacy. And the, what we're striving for right now is to create depth around uh, very specific ideas. And so uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been engaged with UC Berkeley's Blum Center for Developing Economies to uh, really go deep into the subject of development engineering. And so you can go to our site and read a number of different stories on it, including one that was just posted today on um, the relationship of uh, development engineering to the market economy that I'm really excited about. Um, there is a critical piece of that. And one of the things that's most exciting to me as a journalist right now is all the different tools that are available to you. Uh, to tell a story, and so one of those um, one of those tools or one of the realms, I guess, is audience interaction. And so, for me, this is one of those audience interactive moments where uh, we can sort of engage in a a, a hot uh, media exchange with our uh, some of our audience members. So, what I would love to do is try to get through my portion of this as fast as possible, and then move on to the Q and A so that um, uh, you guys can ask as many questions of these great, great moderators as possible. So let me see, can I advance the slide? I'm going to run through these bios very briefly, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll just charge right ahead with uh, their presentation. Uh, Zoe Bizpalko is, a building, is building her career at the intersection of sustainability, technology, and design. With a master's degree in environmental engineering and an MBA in design strategy, she is currently leading the impact modeling initiatives and design efforts at the Autodesk Foundation, supporting the creation of innovative solutions to the world's most pressing social and environmental challenges. Sophie Martin uh, is a doctor and is the innovation director at the Bloom Center for Developing Economies. She develops and executes scaling strategies for technologies coming out of the Bloom Center ecosystem 
working with faculty and students to grow their impact. She also supports social innovators across campus and uh, Blum Center Network in the Big Ideas Contest and the Social Innovator On-Ramp curriculum. Uh, Christian Benimana is the founder of the African Design Center with Mass Design Group in Rwanda. I know there are probably a lot of engineers on this call and uh, Mass Design is a uh, uh, architecture practice. If you don't know who these guys are, uh, it's very tempting to open a new window and like go to their website and check out their work. It's like some of the most stunning and beautiful work that's being done in uh, the whole entire world right now. Um, so we're extremely lucky to have Christian with us. Um, he, uh, he's been involved with the design build projects, development initiatives, operational and administrative leadership at Mass, as well as teaching at the architecture school of the former Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. He is currently leading the implementation of the African Design Center, a project-based apprenticeship that is set to be the new Bauhaus of Africa. Again, this is a really big deal, um, and uh, it's very, very, um, we're very, very lucky to have all three of these wonderful panelists with us. So with that, I'm going to pass the ball over to Zoe. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Can you pass me also? Hey. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Zoe, and I am part of the Autodesk Foundation. Um, we, Autodesk is a design software company, and um, our motto is to imagine, design, and create a better world. Uh, the Sustainability and Foundation team where I work in, uh, we are the philanthropic vehicle of Autodesk, and we really focus on the better world part of our motto. We provide a tool and expertise to inspire and support people to have a positive impact. And in particular, we work with entrepreneurs and innovators, such as non-for-profit organizations, startups, university, uh, or incubators. And we also work with um, Autodesk major customer in industry like product design, manufacturing, or architecture on helping them achieving their sustainability goals. The way we work with these organizations are through supporting them uh, into achieving their goals through the resources that we have as a technology company. So we provide software as well as learning services so that um, we can help our customer to use their tool uh, at their best capabilities to meet their goals. We also provide expertise uh, through our employees with pro bono programs, for instance. And for some uh, nurture customer, we also provide uh, physical space and financial grants. Uh, the work I do, and specifically, is related to these value-added services uh, that we provide to our customer, and really looking at how we can use our resources to maximize the potential for impact of the organization we work with. So I'll just uh, take you through a few examples of uh, the work I do with our customers. So one topic that I'm exploring right now is uh, how we can use the emerging technologies that are coming out of Autodesk Research Group to accelerate the impact of our customers. So here is an example from Build Change in Nepal. Build Change is uh, one of the organizations we work with. It's a non-for-profit organization that trains local community in the design and building of earthquake-resistant houses in emerging countries. They started working with our reality capture team here at Autodesk to use drones and reality capture technology to map out terrain, design, and rebuild after the 2015 earthquake in Nepal. We believe that emerging technology like reality capture, but also uh, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotic, or VR, have the potential to really accelerate the workflow of our customer and uh, therefore to uh, increase the, the, their potential for impact. Another example is, um, uh, of support that we are uh, providing is a residency program that we are piloting right now in our innovation space, Peer9. So we provide access to Peer9, its machine and training, to designers and engineers within our portfolio. The idea here is not only to physically demonstrate some impact design concept, but mostly to support our customer in their fabrication and manufacturing process. Uh, we, uh, we realize that it's often a struggling point 
Uh, and we want to learn from our customer how we can uh, create better tools to help them meet their goal in this uh, specific sector. Uh, finally, I also manage uh, impact measurement initiatives for the Autodesk Foundation, where I gather data and communicate the impact of our activities. I work closely with our grantees on understanding how they measure impact and how we can help them proving the impact of their design. Because I believe that impact measurement is the key for all of the actors in the development engineering and impact design field to communicate the value uh, of our work to other actors. Uh, it can be founders uh, with the hope of receiving more funding, but also people on the field with the hope of increasing performances. So all in all, uh, at the Autodesk Foundation, we really see philanthropy as risk capital for impact. We want to invest in innovation for which our resources have the potential to maximize uh, the impact of the organization we work with. Uh, and hopefully, these uh, innovation could grow into large-scale initiative. So thank you. And I'll pass it to Sophie. Hi, everybody. I'm really pleased to join you today. Uh, it's morning where I'm sitting, but I realize everyone's from all over the world, and it's really exciting to have this global exchange this morning. As David mentioned, I'm from UC Berkeley uh, Public University here in California, and I am uh, Innovation Director at the Blum Center for Developing Economies, which is a, an interdisciplinary hub for students and faculty looking to do research and uh, develop new ideas and new solutions for global challenges. Uh, and one of our marquee programs is something called development engineering. It really got started out of a, a large research endeavor that we are partnering with USAID on, um, which seeks to develop new technologies and to scale those technologies for low resource settings all over the globe. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this program today. So <clears throat> I'm the, the staff lead on this program and development engineering as we conceive of it is really hoping to design products and services that improve poor people's lives at scale. And one of the key ways that we think about doing this is <clears throat> not just having well-meaning engineers um, conceive of good ideas in labs and then try to deploy them somewhere and hope for good outcomes, but rather to um, facilitate teaming across engineering, business, economics, social sciences, and other fields that are going to be critical to developing lasting solutions because they take into account all of the various um, constraints and opportunities that exist within low resource settings. Um, so one of the kind of key things that we do in this program is we train students and we support research um, across these fields. And this is really our framework for thinking about um, development engineering as a concept, and this is what we apply in our classes and in our research. Um, a lot of our development engineering projects and class projects as well, not just research projects, are problem-oriented. So we really begin with a deep dive with students and really try to get them to understand deeply problems within their context. Um, so working with communities, working with um, people to understand what the problems are before we think of solutions and then moving through kind of a classic design framework which is the blue circle in the middle or the blue uh, triangles that make a circle here we'll really start with observation first um, and then we work to develop a framework and, and understand some insights about those challenges we develop some concepts then we prototype those solutions together um, with communities and then we kind of iterate in this circle over and over again. We do this in the classroom and in the research groups, as I mentioned. All of this is informed by qualitative and quantitative data. We uh, have large training programs in sensors and data acquisition and large data and statistics and economics. Um, and then all of this is wrapped up with um, thinking about scaling for impact. So when we form teams, we encourage students to form teams that really bring together all of the necessary components, so not just the technical piece of design, but also the business models, the economic frameworks that might be needed, the political frameworks that we need to be aware of um, to make lasting solutions. And so all of these, this design framework is done within the context of development goals and constraints, but also opportunities 
Uh, we think there's a lot of really unique and interesting research questions that are not answered um, that are unique to low resource settings. Uh, so there's a really, really interesting research questions that are uh, being pursued by some of our faculty and students. And so we, we hope to support those folks and we have a whole program around that within our development engineering um, ecosystem. Um, what this is is a, um, a, a bubble chart, if you will, that was developed at a, at a technical convening. So it's called TechCon. It's actually the annual meeting of our USAID uh, grantee um, cohort. It's us and a few other universities and, and practitioners and NGOs. They get together and think about development challenges and development solutions as we're coming up with them. And so in this particular session that we had last November, uh, a group of universities and NGOs and development practitioners came together and had um, an ideation, um, idea generation kind of exercise to come up with the skills that we think that development practitioners really need. And so these were some of the ideas that we came up with. And really at the core of all of this uh, is humility and being open-minded and coming at things not with a solution first and trying to shoehorn it into a, a very a certain context, but rather coming in and recognizing that I myself don't have all the answers. I need to learn from the community and how they're solving their problems. And maybe, maybe at the end of all, all this understanding, I can sit, um, I can, I can be of service with my skills. Um, and so these are all the other skills that we've come up with, and these are some of the things that we're aiming to train within our classes um, at the UC Berkeley campus. So we're building humility and empathy. We're training people to work in multidisciplinary teams. So engineers have a very different kind of work style and work plan um, than say economists do or business folks do. And so how do you work together to bring your skill set um, to be a complement to the other skill sets that are around you uh, to come up with solutions that uh, stick and are adopted by communities? Um, this is one example student that we are extremely proud of in our development engineering program. His name is Will Tarpe. He's graduating this spring, just a few short months. Uh, he came to us a few years ago, and he's an environmental engineering PhD student, but he joined development engineering very early on. And his project is looking at um, redesigning sanitation systems, and he's working in partnership with a, a social enterprise in Kenya uh, called Sanergy to make uh, urine and feces profitable, basically, making toilet use uh, something that has a business, a sustainable business model. And so classically speaking, an environmental engineer wouldn't necessarily be thinking about business models or economics or policy, right, but because he's trying to develop a solution that actually will be long, you know, will have some longevity. He's working with a lot of underground partners. He's working with economists and business folks on our campus to think about how the solution can be structured from the beginning in the right way. And so he's bringing the engineering piece, but he's working with all these other folks. And um, he's been a tremendous participant within our DevEng programs and really a passionate advocate for this approach. Um, and as he says, this designated emphasis, which is basically the way that our uh, development engineering program is structured is as a minor for PhD students on our campus, and we call that a designated emphasis. So the minor is really meaningful because it recognizes that interstitial space that otherwise just isn't recognized. So really the crux of these solutions is between the engineering and the business and the economics and the social sciences. It's not any one of these skill sets by themselves that's gonna make that lasting impact. And because it's interstitial, some of our researchers of, um, you know, at the very beginning of our USAID engagement were saying, hey, you know, I'm an engineer and some of my engineering journals aren't super interested in my applied, um, you know, toilet solution or my uh, applied uh, information technology. And some of the economists were saying some of our economics journals aren't super interested in, in my understanding of how these technologies are adopted. And so we worked really hard with Elsevier, which is a, is a publishing house of scientific journals to stand up a brand new journal um, that serves as a home for some of this interdisciplinary work. And it really recognizes the key and really interesting research problems that exist at the interstitial spaces between engineering and economics, engineering and business. And it serves as a home for some of these um, really cool projects that otherwise maybe wouldn't get the light of day and wouldn't be so widely communicated. So we're really proud of that particular institutional change that we're driving and will hopefully lead to the longevity of this program. So uh, with that, I want to uh, say thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to your questions and to hearing from you about this program and hearing about how we can collaborate. Uh, but with that, I'd love to hand it off to Christian to hear more about 
uh, his work. Okay, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, probably the only one um, joining the webinar from across uh, the continent. Um, uh, it's evening here at 6, 6 30 p.m., so I appreciate uh, the invitation. Um, just a little bit background of, of, of the, the context in which we operate. We are uh, we're a firm of about 60 people uh, with two offices in Boston and Kigali, and we uh, most of our projects uh, we operate in. Uh, in in the part of the world where uh, you would say that poverty is rampant and this comes with many challenges to vital systems for society to function in a sustainable way. Uh, these are mainly the lack of access to, to these basic needs, healthcare, housing, education, democracy, opportunities for work and prosper, etc. And in a few cases where there is access, many communities still struggle with uh, crippled infrastructure and systems. Um, so we strongly believe that uh, architecture can play a vital role uh, to be a catalyst to bring positive transformation um, to these solutions and the communities that they are meant for, uh, even beyond. Um, we have three core principles um, uh, that, um, uh, that we govern our work, if you will. And the first one uh, is that um, architecture can improve life and, and can uh, impact it and change it in a positive way. Uh, and that is the realization that um, the parents in the Botara Hospital that we built in 2011 in the north of Rwanda, uh, not only this hospital challenged the traditional understanding of rural healthcare infrastructure, it also set a new standard um, of what quality healthcare need to be, uh, not for the few privileged ones, but uh, for everyone. And that if it is possible in the rural Rwanda, then it should be possible everywhere. Um, and then the second principle uh, is that um, architecture must have a clear, architecture and design must have a clear, uh, legible mission that seeks to push the boundaries of the impact uh, it can have on the community. And um, one quick example I'll give is of this uh, young gentleman called Akiza. Um, uh, the, 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 the tireless effort to, to, that went on to design a wall cladding system for the Butara Hospital uh, that used this volcanic uh, 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 stone uh, has gone on to creating a completely new trait. Um, of volcanic masons. And this newly created skill has transformed farmers literally into contractors. Uh, and the best example is of this guy uh, who's now a member of a cooperative that currently does this work um, all over Rwanda and we hope he can bring that also like in the region and, and beyond if, if not possible because it was proven to be uh, a, a great innovation. And then the, other, the last principle of, of the office we work from is that uh, um, the process of architecture and design um, is as important, if not more, um, than the outcome. Um, so we're convinced that uh, uh, by using the right approach and paying uh, special attention to the process, we can position ourselves to achieve both direct and indirect impact. Uh, if you think that by limiting the construction industry, one of the leading sectors in the growth in poor countries exclusively to men, then you begin to ignore the benefits of availing income to women, especially in relatively poor communities where studies have shown that the income in women's control is more likely to be used towards children nutrition and education, as opposed to alcohol, drugs, and gambling. And this is not to say that all men are irresponsible, but the ratio of how much of the income goes to support the household increases significant, significantly when in the hands of women than men. And the family well-being gets translated into, chain, into chances to prosper into a better life, creating more opportunities for women, youth, and so-called unskilled people, etc. are all avenues that architecture and design can make a huge difference in fighting the injustice that comes with an unbalanced sharing of resources in limited resources setting. Um, so through our work, um, we have come to understand that these lessons to scale up and reach the many people on this planet in need, it is critical that we create a movement of like minds that adopts this approach we call LOFAN, uh, in foreign means locally fabricated. And by adopting this approach, we can see more and more examples that fight injustices and start creating the, the needed equity. 
So the low carb approach uh, has these four uh, ingredients uh, that, that you have on the screen. Uh, you, for every project, you try to, to, to hire locally when you reach the implementation, not only for the economic reasons, but also to create avenues for participation and ownership. Um, sourcing of your materials is, is as important, uh, again, not only for the economic reason, but to offset as much as you can the carbon uh, footprint associated with the transportation and create an unmistakably and mistake about contextual identity for the projects. Right? That's very important to us as well. Invest in training. Um, and, and because when you always look at a project implementation as an opportunity to have testing platform, um, an existing skill can be elevated or a new skill can be taught or recreated or invented, uh, similar to the volcanic stone uh, that, that we, uh, that we I, I, I presented earlier. And then uphold the dignity. Uh, always take the time to assess whether the decisions we make uh, do not create injustices um, uh, at the end of, of, of the project or, 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 or two years down the road. Uh, so the African Design Center is, is, our, is our response to create this movement that we're going to make a radical transformation that will not only solve the obvious problems you can clearly, clearly see in limited resources settings, but also force us to take a look at the rest of the world and how our site is functioning now and understand what more can architecture and design do towards a safe, sustainable, equitable, and just world. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to your, to, to your, your questions and comments and, and, and ideas on how we could uh, advance this, um, uh, this uh, monumental task we have ahead. And I thank you very much. I'll pass the ball back to David. Perfect. So I guess uh, this next part of the um, the schedule, I'll offer a couple of questions, and then each, each panelist can sort of weigh in on them. So the first I would say is um, talking about like challenges that you consistently face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what would you say are, you know, one or two of the big challenges that are that you consistently face. Christian, why don't you start? As long as you're you're hot talking. Um, that's a really hard question to ask me because <laughs> uh, we, we everything so going challenges. well. Huh? Sorry. Because everything's going well all the time. Yes. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kidding. So the biggest challenge we face, I think, uh, in our line of work, I would say the biggest one is is a is, a, is an interpretation of what uh, people's lives worth is, because we tend to to find a, a significant variation um, when we treat when we're talking about uh, creating infrastructure uh, as less of things uh, or spatial. Uh, structures that affect our lives on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and you find that uh, when the the impact those uh, those structures have on our lives are, are, are overlooked by the people in position of power, not only it translates into poor infrastructure, but it translates into bigger problems than even design itself cannot fix. And our, and our biggest biggest challenge for now is the mindset. It's basically to to always prove, like uh, Zoe mentioned earlier, that impact measurements has to be, you know, a key um, a key a, a, a key aspect of development. Like you you want to be able to articulate to these people that not everything is should be translated in monetary value, and that's not an easy task. Um, that that that's the biggest challenge. And then obviously the second one is is, is um, I would say that it's had to do with uh, having enough time and resources to actually invest enough into providing adequate solutions. Uh, oftentimes, we're pushed to, you know, in the corner of providing a patch solution to a problem when we can clearly say, you know, if you spend extra amount, extra amount of time or x amount of extra amount of uh, uh, of resources, we're able to come up with an adequate solution that can actually solve like long-term uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. So those are the biggest ones that we we we, we face in, in our line of work on a day-to-day -day basis. Perfect. 
Um, Zoe, what about you? Sure. I mean, I will resonate with these comments and, and, you know, reiterate on what I've said about communicating our value. And I think that um, I see it both working with people from the field where they're struggling communicating their um, their impact to other funders, um, but I also see it like as a foundation within a corporation like Autodesk where our currency is impact. And as a non-revenue generating group within Desk, we need also to communicate what we are doing and the value of it to the rest of the company. So kind of this really this link around uh, how we measure and how we communicate what we do uh, is, I think, really key to the sector. And um, I would say that there are some uh, field of practice uh, that have figured it out pretty well, such as the environmental field. In sustainability, we use, um, you know, carbon emission as the golden standard to talk about um, the impact we have. Uh, but in the social sector, uh, I think there is a lot of conversation happening, but there is still not one, um, one matrix or one standard that everyone can use um, so that we all speak the same language and we all understand each other's um, activities and impact. And so I think that um, sort of this, um, the fact that it's nothing is settled and it's a little bit messy in the field of impact measurement so for social innovation uh, doesn't help uh, people from, uh, you know, organization on the ground to funders uh, really uh, reach the maximum potential for impact. Hey, Sophie. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so I completely agree with both Christian and Zoe. I'm going to reiterate exactly what they said: communications and impact, and time and resources. I mean, those are really the four things. Um, but in our context, what I would say that um, we really think that we can have the biggest impact with new ideas and with new partnerships and new um, research output is really in sending people to the field so that they're not. Um, you know, kind of just sitting around our campus thinking of great ideas, but really working with communities in the context um, with these challenges that um, exist all over the world and are unique in different contexts. And so for us, it's really sending students, sending researchers to the field, and for that, time and resources are the key kind of issue. Um, and we really hope, you know, through those engagements to build that humility and empathy that I talked about and to build that really contextual knowledge. Um, and on a more technical side, actually, one of the challenges that a lot of our um, ideas and um, research projects face is they get to this place where they are piloting and they're really excited. They have great um, initial results, uh, but then they don't quite know how to start building um, or how to start um, developing the supply chains needed for larger pilots or larger engagements. And so we're really working on building partnerships and working on um, helping to um, arm those people with skills to build local partnerships with government agencies, with local uh, with local businesses and others to try to build those out. But, you know, to the extent that anyone has insights on how to strengthen supply chains in developing economies, I think that would be a technical issue that we face um, that would really help to accelerate the impact that we would like to see in the world. Great. I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about what you've learned from those that you seek to serve. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about this call or this webinar right now is that we have Autodesk Foundation, which is a funder, we have an academic institution, and we have somebody who's actually working day to day as a professional in the field. Uh, but what we don't have is uh, one of the end, the client or the beneficiary or the end user. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've learned from um, uh, the people who you work for. Maybe Christian, can you start with that? Yes, definitely I can start. I think I would say that the biggest lesson I've learned is that people um, have an incredible ability to to adapt to to, to bad situations and um, and usually that um, you know through that process of adaptation there is an incredible ingenuity that is hidden in in the survival mode that people develop that I also feel like. Uh, designers or, or architects or engineers who've been in a privileged, in a more or less privileged position, 
you might not necessarily be able to come up with a, a solution, and that's like a rich, um, uh, a, a rich uh, source for us to get inspiration from, to, to be motivated and, 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 and work harder to, to either optimize those solutions or, um, or, or, or amplify them or, or you know, um, push them to, to the utmost level of achievable impact. If I'm right. Great. Sophie, can you talk about that? Can you talk about how some of your students' work benefits from the impact of, or from the feedback with the, the client, let's say? Yeah, so I mean, one of the critical things that we've learned and continue to learn all the time is uh, exactly what Christian said, which is that communities are so innovative. Um, people are solving their own problems, right? Um, they may not be solving them the way that we would have assumed from the outside, if you will, or from our place in the world, that they would solve them the same way as, as we might face the similar situation. But it's just so cool to see how people have approached um, different challenges and how what really innovative ways they've come up with. And so I think that's one of the key lessons that I've taken, which is to come with an open mind and open eyes and ears first, um, you know, and really listen um, because there's so many kind of cool ideas out there already. And the other thing kind of building on that is that you know, we're not the first to try to solve this problem. So if if water access is a challenge in the community, there's a reason that it's not there. And, and the people have no doubt been trying to fix this for a long time. And so figuring out what's worked already, what is already starting to work, and how can we build on that rather than starting from scratch and starting from, from no context um, and to really try to accelerate the change rather that's already ongoing rather than to, you know, upend the system and bring in some new solution that may or may not fit. So that's been kind of my biggest learning. So Louis, for you, this question seems <clears throat> maybe multi-layered because you're, the people that you serve in some ways are your portfolio mm -hmm. companies. And so you could, I would, I'm very good with your portfolio, one of the companies in your portfolio. I'm interested in, th like, knowing how you learn from from the people that you, the, the people that you support. Sure. I mean, as I was saying, like, one of my role here is really looking at how we use our resources to support these different organizations. And I think, as you said, we are sort of a step remote from people uh, directly on the field, but still through, you know, our conversation and the work we do with our, our customer, we are able uh, to learn a lot. And I think that, um, you know, the first one is uh, I think there is a lot of challenges out there, and I'm really impressed to see how um, we are working in a field that is really tapping into each other's skills. It's uh, deeply interdisciplinary. And I really liked um, Sophie's slides around different skills that are needed in uh, the field of impact design because it's really showing this need for uh, reaching out to other disciplines and being uh, humble and very curious. I would say that um, as a technology company as well, I think that um, something that I've been seeing and learning is sort of this eagerness to, you know, use new tools. Um, and, uh, and so as a company, our role is also to look at how we can bring these tools to the people that need it. And so there is more and more effort uh, from Autodesk to really make um, the software tools uh, more accessible to everyone and particularly people in the field. And, you know, as historically, um, our software were really reserved for engineers and architects, and we are seeing more and more um, uh, people using them uh, directly on the field. So that's one of the uh, biggest learning for me. Okay, so I'm going to start pulling questions out of the chat box. So if anybody who's attending wants to, uh, wants to ask something of the panelists, put it in there, and I'll... I'll just try to add them. So the one uh, that you right away is, can you provide some additional examples beyond Autodesk of industry engagement support for impact design and development engineering? Who else is, uh, who else is providing funding or support? Uh, this is Sophie here. Um, one of our major partners is USAID and other development agencies and um, you know, some foundations as well are looking at this. Um, so it's it's kind of diverse pool. I think we're we're trying to build 
momentum around this and really build a case for the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work. I think a lot of times we face um, kind of disciplinary constraints within some of some funding avenues. So we're really building on on uh, that interdisciplinary angle. And I think USAID has really recognized that and a lot of other agencies and funders are starting to move that way as well. Okay, USAID, anybody else? I think there are a number of foundations that we're looking at, and actually, I, Impact Vine Hub is trying to do a better job of cataloging and uh, organizing uh, the funders. And in fact, we're at the moment putting together an infographic that tries to catalog um, many of the quote unquote funding trailblazers that are operating in this space. So um, check back in with us in maybe like a month's time, and you might find a, a uh, sort of a larger document that organizes uh, that. Um, one question is uh, having to do with uh, your attitudes towards risk and your appetite for risk, let's say, in um, low resource communities. Uh, Christian, what's the what's Mass's attitude towards like uh, risk and potential for small failures? Um. Yeah. So that's uh, um that's something that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason, uh, I mean, the way we've, we found to cope with that is, is, is to, to make sure dialogue is happening all the time, to go uh, above and beyond what an, an average architectural uh, firm would over, offer for a service, because there's a lot of advocacy work that needs to happen before we put our papers on, on paper. So uh, as much as you, you try to mitigate the risk, but it's more it's less of, of mitigating the risk to you, but uh, mitigating the risk of failure uh, of, 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 of the initiative. And, and, and one of the best ways to, to, to frame the argument is to, to present as many opportunities that chance offers and, and hope that you know, people will understand where the opportunity lies rather than you know, remaining in the safe box and, and, and try to take a shot with you and they give that commitment that they're actually going to go uh, the extra mile with you to reach uh, that uh, uh, that full impact. Um, Zoe, I'm curious about your attitude, uh, your Autodesk's or uh, appetite for risk. Sure. Well, so as uh, you know, investment vehicle, I think that uh, we recognize the fact that there are risk um, involved into the work we do. Part uh, on the f financial side, and um, and in particular, as we are really looking at investing in innovation and sometimes uh, you know early stage, small scale projects. Uh, but you know, I think that everyone in the design field would recognize that uh, failure is part of our job, and that's how uh, we learned. I think that uh, the role as a foundation like us is really to evaluate this risk and minimize it. Um, and I think this is still, again, linked to you know a deep evaluation in terms of what is the potential for impact, how do we measure that, and how do we uh, create uh, metrics along the way that are able to you know indicate us uh, how. Um, how a project is is doing and uh, how uh, this risk is uh, minimized uh, along the way. So uh, we really approach risk as uh, any other investors, as well as uh, through a design a mindset of uh, seeing risk as a learning experience. Beautiful. Sophie, do you want to talk uh, kind of briefly about how your students or how you um, – you know, how you kind of counsel students to uh, manage risk? Yeah, so I think um, both our students and researchers, um, you know, um, development work is risky and innovation is risky by its nature. Um, but you, what you want to do, I think, what all of us seek to do is to minimize the risk to the communities um, and to the people whom we're trying to help, right? So I think that's kind of the main perspective that we're going at it with and I think the way that we go about it is to like I said kind of understand deeply the problems and sometimes that involves um, you know bring in partners that would normally be kind of uncomfortable for people to talk to so for example an engineering student might have to talk to a local council member in the local government to really understand why a certain you know what what the history of certain infrastructure development is or whatever and so kind of build that um, build that local network and I think that is 
building building solutions on top of knowledge, I think, is the way that we go about it. And to understand the full context of the of the challenge that a community is facing before we attempt a solution is one way to mitigate that risk. I think to Zoe's point, really having a clear set of metrics that are pointing toward a really clear outcome, really clear goal, and really understanding what it'll take to get there. You know, building your theory of change, if you will. Um, in a, in a robust way before you really start monkeying around with people's lives, I think is really important. Um, so that's how we deal with it in brief. Okay, um, to kind of close this, could you guys each ask each other a question? Start with you, Zoe. Could you ask like one of the other panelists a question? Um, sure, I mean, I will, I will, like I'm curious about how, um, you know, Christian is, looking at uh, the future of design in Africa and uh, particularly on how uh, he's thinking about scaling up this initiative of uh, the African Design Center. In my dreams, in my dream world, uh, the future of architecture in Africa would, uh, would serve as a canvas that uh, do not only like solve the, the current problems that the continent is facing or it's planned to face in the, in the, in the near future, because of the population growth and, 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 and rapid urbanization, but also uh, provide a chance to, for the rest of the world to also look under the hood and see um, uh, how do we repair the damage that has been caused by um, these ineffective systems that, that we've been implementing for the past, uh, I don't know, a few hundred years. Um, and, and, and part of it is, is, is how do we, uh, change the perception of uh, certain disciplines such as architecture, design, engineering, uh, that initially were thought to be uh, uh, solutions providers to, to, to real societal solutions to simple um, uh, solutions vending uh, disciplines. And, and this, is a, this is the biggest problem. Um, and, the, and, the, and the way I see that is, is the, the, the African Design Center, uh, it, it took, We'll try to address that at, at a scale level first on the continent uh, to try to understand what are the best solutions that you can come up with to solve uh, these immediate problems, but for a long, a long term. If you allow me, I want to also like answer really quickly a question asked by uh, Katie Argo. Uh, about, he said, like, can you provide a, an example of a situation where human dignity is sacrificed and how to overcome it? Uh, so. One of the examples I always like to give is uh, that I hope African Design Center will be able to, to change, or to scale, to a big scale, is for instance, how do we understand education and how, uh, let's say, uh, architectural infrastructure solutions we provide for education actually have much, much bigger impact than uh, providing simple classroom or shelter for uh, education activities. Because education is set to you know, to train young people for a future that we might not see, that we don't know what it is, and, and keeps evolving and, and grows. So the notion that because you're building a school somewhere in rural Africa and you, you can build it for $10,000, not only hurts one generation because, you know, they don't have really a good school that provides, you know, stimulating learning spaces for young children, but it sells false hope to this community that, you know, they're going to get education that will help them get out of this poverty, but it ends up hurting them more because they don't get out of that poverty. They sink into it even more. So how do we change that? And then if that's the case and we can crack that, you know, that, uh, that solution or that, that, that formula for the rural settings, then can you look back at communities that, you know, put so much resources into education do and then and then question you know is it you know rightly utilized or are we wasting resources or how has it caught up with the changes in recent education that brought was brought by technology and and, and advancement and all of the all of these you know um, new uh, new things like internet and, and, and things so like that's where I see like the future of architecture on the continent be, basically becoming the becoming the the, 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 the the conversation starter to start addressing larger issues uh, to the rest of the world. And hopefully the African Design Center will be uh, an institution that is behind 
uh, this uh, uh, let's all of these conversations and all of this uh, advocacy. Okay, um, I think we're, we're getting low on time, so I want one final question. Sophie, could you kind of direct the question over to uh, Autodesk Foundation? I think you know. It's been it's been a real pleasure to work with Autodesk Foundation already. Some of our programs, um, and it's been really inspirational to partner. And um, I'm just, I guess, wondering, you know, what what other, what other opportunities? I think maybe the listeners on the on the webinar might have to partner with Autodesk Foundation on their impact design um, challenges and projects and and ideas, and and how we might move forward on that kind of partnership. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that we work with multiple type of partner, as I explained. Uh, we also uh, usually, actually, uh, we are being reached out either uh, directly, but most of the time through recommendation of uh, other people in our portfolio that uh, work with partners. So it's really about creating this ecosystem uh, that sort of supports uh, itself and, you know, get to us. So, you know, you should feel free to um, anyone that is interested on uh, support from the Autodesk Foundation as well as just being part of the conversation uh, could reach out to us through, you know, our website, autodesk.org, uh, or shoot me in an email that uh, you had on one of my slides. Um, I think that also, you know, the Impact Design Hub is a great resource uh, where we also uh, bring a lot of um, information out there, and so uh, people should be uh, feel free also to go and dig into uh, the resources that are out there. Okay, I think this is a great uh, point to sort of conclude on. I'm so grateful for the three panelists um, showing up today and bringing you know, their unique perspective to this conversation. Um, it's conversations like this that um, I get to have every day and it makes, it fills me with optimism about, you know, the, what the future is going to look like. And so I'm very, very grateful, very, very inspired. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Iana, who's going to um, close this thing down and take a, uh, tell you about how to cash in your credits and so forth. <laughs> thank you so much, David, and, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, this was an incredibly rich discussion. Um, we're certainly uh, very excited uh, to build the momentum around impact design and development engineering worldwide and uh, know that uh, your efforts are, are really contributing to a much larger change worldwide. Um, for all the attendees, thank you so much for your participation today. Uh, you can certainly find the recording of this webinar uh, in a few days on our platform. I'll look to the webinars page for that. If you're looking to get your professional development hours, please uh, submit the form that's on our professional development page with the PDH code listed here. And if you have more questions that uh, weren't addressed or you'd like uh, to have uh, the panelists weigh in on it, feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Um, don't forget to become an E4C member to get information about our upcoming webinars. And also, uh, we hope to catch you on the next one in a week or in March, uh, where we'll be exploring topics around robotics and global development and professionalism and well drilling. Have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be, and uh, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.